Um, okay, so then uh, just to give a, to start on the overview, um, I'll give a little bit of a core organization. Um, the Center for Proteome Analysis is a centralized core at IU School of Medicine. And what that means is that um, we exist within an academic department. So then um, I'm a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, and then we report uh, to Dr. Weiss just from an academic perspective, uh, but for centralized cores, we actually um, report to uh, Dr. Dr. Farood, um, who's the EADR. And then in additional um, oversight, we have oversight from school operations committees um, and also a proteomics advisory board and the members of those board can be shown over here. So the people that we have working in the lab are myself and then Dr. Emma Dowd, who, I, as I said, will be um, presenting with us today as well. Um, and, then, and then Dr. Tina Guo, who's um, here, who I'll talk about a little bit at the end, was one of our targeted methods. And then uh, we have great support from Mandy Bittner, who is our program manager. She is on leave at the moment, but she um, will be happy to help when she's back. She'll be back in mid-November. Um, and then we have two research analysts, um, Whitney Smith Kinneman here um, at the bottom, and then Casey Hansen, who's um, shown right here in the center. And so, um, and a lot of different projects, they're pretty multidisciplinary and they can take a lot of bench and computational work. And so because of that, we actually distribute a number of the projects uh, between multiple people within the core. And so often you might work with um, two or more people um, on an individual project, um, depending on um, how extensive it is or if it's, if it's really close to one of our standard protocols. And so um, just to give you guys some ideas of the scope of our core, um, I did um, include this. This is from our last annual review um, that we support a lot of different departments within the IU School of Medicine. And so we're not really, a, that's why we're a centralized core and we're not, um, we're not only supporting um, like the biochemistry department that I'm in, although you'll see that, that that is listed here. And so then in addition, we have a number of different users from external academics, um, including a number of people that are within the CTSI. And so um, that's a pretty big list. There's a list over to the right of a number of the different institutions that we supported in the last fiscal year. Uh, but this is something that we're happy to do as well. In the last year, um, we've actually done over 217 projects um, and then supported um, a, a larger number of users because we also provide support for um, grant development, um, uh, grant we do consultations um, that, are, that are no charge for um, overview type of experiments, but if we need to do in-depth experimental planning, um, we do have consultation fees um, that we can bill for that if it's more in-depth and um, just kind of overall planning and recommendations on replicates and experimental design. Um, and then we also um, um, can provide letters of support, facilities, and then also data management plans. So if you need any of that information, you could reach out to us. I would actually recommend right now, you're welcome to use um, our listserv, which is the entire core, uh, but you can list out, you can email myself and Dr. Dowd um, until uh, Mandy's back from leave. And so then, and we can help you um, with those sorts of things and, and um, work with, with you with someone with a core facility. And so one of the things that we've really been increasing is our automation. And Dr. Dowd's gonna talk about that some today uh, within her project. And so we have an Agilent assay map Bravo, uh, which is a liquid handler system um, for a lot of different uh, pipetting based protocols. Uh, we can also do things like on um, the assay map Bravo has, has affinity tips. And so um, there are some affinity reactions that we can do um, at scale. Uh, but the optimization of those experiments is something that we do not receive support for from School of Medicine. So those have to be factored in um, as a cost to the user. So if you wanted to develop a large scale affinity purification method um, as part of a grant, we would just budget in the fees for that method development um, as well as the actual performance of the experiments. Um, and we can do that also for the development of targeted proteomics um, methods. And so we have to, to bill for that time for method development as well. And we can plan for that with quotes and upfront consult consultation like I had spoken about earlier. Um, this pairs really nicely with one of our HPLCs, which is the EvoCEP, um, which uses a tip format. So each tip is kind of like a miniature column. And those columns um, actually do um, sample cleanup 
and then we can eject those um, directly into the mass spec. So this is in a, a tip rack, so it's a 96 um, well format, uh, which pairs really nicely with the assay mat Bravo. And Dr. Dowd has gotten that set up now, um, along with EvoCEP, they, they help develop methods for the assay mat Bravo for tip loading. And so we can load 96 samples at a time um, using this system to run them on this EvoCEP for analysis. So that really helps to facilitate this 100, um, 100 plus sample per day processing uh, when that's needed. So then um, this is just an overview of our core services and I um, did not add all of our, um, our ad additional um, um, new, our newer functionalities on here, but just generally what we're gonna talk about today are the targeted proteomics methods. So this small square here at the bottom, uh, which includes parallel reaction monitoring, which Dr. Dowd is gonna talk about. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about our Olink Explore platform, uh, which we do for, with the Center for Medical Genomics. Uh, but in addition to these targeted methods, we do untargeted proteomics or discovery proteomics or shotgun proteomics. There's a lot of different ways that they refer to this in the literature uh, where we can do global protein expression analysis. Uh, we can do small or large scale post-translational modification analysis. We can do protein-protein interaction analysis. Um, and we also uh, can provide methods for thermal proteome profiling. All of this is also, um, there's a foundation of computational analysis specifically for the proteomics data. We can generate fold changes in statistical analyses that then you could work with us on it, or you could take that data and then work with one of the bioinformatics cores or your own bioinformatician collaborators uh, to be able to do further analysis on that data. That's true of all those and the targeted proteomics methods. So we'll talk about that. I think that Dr. Dow is going to talk about that a little bit um, with her uh, PRM experiments as well. Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dowd, um, but if there are any questions right now on the overview, we can take them now, uh, but I can also take those at the end, so feel free to wait. Here, wait, wait. Did you want to do the trigger channel? Oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. So I forgot that I did have some slides I was going to present um, that are also targeted mass spectrometry based on the isobaric trigger channel. Thank you, Emma. So then, um, so then this is an option that is still mass spectrometry based and it's kind of a hybrid targeted assay um, that is also does discovery based analysis. So it's kind of in between those two areas. Um, there's a paper that we published in 2021 where we applied this method. Uh, that work was led by uh, graduate students Sarah Justice and Neil McCracken, which have both graduated now. Um, but this is something that we can do for kind of um, specific applications, and so we can talk to you about this. Um, the trigger channel is basically where we add in um, a certain target of interest, like a recombinant protein, um, to be able to look for specific peptides that are um, coming from that recombinant or um, um, a, a synthetic peptide or other type of affinity purified complexes. And we can do that to make sure that the mass spectrometer prioritizes acquisition of um, specific targets of interest within reason. So if you have an extremely low level um, protein, uh, this method still may not be enough to give you a, a limit of detection that would be able to, to detect those peptides. And then that might be something that you want to look at the other two platforms that we're going to talk about today, either um, um, parallel reaction monitoring or PRM or the O-Link platform. So then that's something that we can add in as we go. Uh, but the idea here is this is a tandem mass tag or TMT based analysis in which we use these um, isobaric barcodes. Um, so we barcode the samples, but we can add a sample which has a, um, a reagent or a affinity complex of interest, synthetic peptide, recombinant protein. We've used lots of different targets here. And then when we do that, um, the increased signal that we add in allows this to be uh, selectively detected by the mass spectrometer. Um, in methods that I won't go into deep detail about. We've actually also coupled this method with a PRM-based method for uh, Dr. Carmela evans Molina's lab, um, and that, that has been published, so we published that um, in 2019 in the journal Biological Chemistry. And so what it can do for you is that you can see the different channels um, from the TMT reporter ions, and then the trigger channel is much higher abundance, and that's what gives us the higher sensitivity uh, because it's going to be um, out there for the mass spec to be able to detect 
um, at, a, at a higher signal to noise. So that's going to assist with acquisition. And we can do this and acquire um, this. In this case, it was a, a endogenously purified protein complex. And so we could also acquire information on post-translational modifications and prioritize the analysis of this specific protein complex, which is called the cleavage and polydylation factor. If we look at that here, so it's a complex that has multiple subunits, uh, 14 different subunits. And then across all of the trigger channel based analyses, um, we were able to detect around 317 unique sequences reproducibly. So we, repeat, we, we, we got those over and over and over again because of that boost in the signal to noise. Um, whereas if we did not add the trigger channel, ana trigger channel analysis, um, we had about 79 peptides that were reproducibly detected. Um, but we can, so this really increases the reproducibility of those methods. And we can see that here. So then um, these are all the different subunits of that protein complex. And in black is where we didn't have the trigger analysis. And so you can see that some of the proteins we can detect pretty well. Uh, but once we added in the trigger channel, we could see reproducible and high level um, um, identification and quantification of all of the subunits of this protein complex. And so some of them, like this one at the end, YTH1, was not detected unless we had the trigger channel. So that's one way that we can get around that problem of the limited dynamic range of mass spectrometry. Okay, so then now I'll turn it over to Anna. Sorry, I'll leave that for you so you can. Great. Thank you, Amber. And I think uh, the trigger channel is a really great method, and we've used it in a number of different projects. However, sometimes you really need absolute quantification, and you want to run maybe thousands of samples. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about parallel reaction monitoring, which is a targeted mass spectrometry method. You may have heard of multiple reaction monitoring, MRM or PRM. Um, we're doing PRM here because we have a Orbitrap, where we are isolating precursor ions fragmenting those precursor ions specifically and detecting only the fragments from those precursor ions. Um, here is a summary and I highly recommend if you haven't heard of this method checking out some of the literature, including this IGMS 2015 paper. So I will say that as opposed to some of our other untargeted methods or the trigger channel, there's really significant development method development required for any of these assays. Um, it does give you precise absolute quantification, however, so in certain situations, including the scenario I'm going to talk about today, this can be the mass spec method of choice. So today I'm going to talk about a collaboration that's been ongoing with the model AD, which is model organism development and evaluation for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is a consortium that started in 2016 after uh, the National Institute for Aging noticed that there was a real lack in translational science in Alzheimer's disease and really getting uh, molecules from academics into the clinic. So model AD is prioritizing late onset Alzheimer's disease variants looking at specific animal models and what I really think is fantastic about this consortium is that they're driven by this broad un unrestricted distribution of all of the data and all of the models. So even the genetic models that they have um, copyrighted are available for all academic usage. And so I've been working with the preclinical testing core, which is a consortium of academic researchers at Indiana University School of Medicine, Jackson Laboratories in Maine, uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Sage Bionetworks. However, there's a lot of several other different uh, components of the model AD consortium. Today, I'm just going to talk about some of the preclinical testing pipeline with the use of a biotherapeutic. And so the PTC group within model AD has published several papers, which I highly recommend checking out, uh, specifically looking at prophylactic treatment of early onset Alzheimer's disease and these two different small molecules. So in having a full characterization of, of the disease, they look at both the modeling of target engagement, the PKPD of the small molecule, as well as full characteristic of a highly uh, developed st statistical study. So this study is powered by having a number of different mice of 5X FAD genotypes, uh, including male and female across a number of different months. Uh, these published stud studies, uh, all the data is available online in the model AD portal, and so all available. 
However, they wanted to move to a biotherapeutic as uh, Alzheimer's and other diseases are more often using therapeutic antibodies to treat disease. So they started working with chronic uh, with chimeric aducanumab in 2020, late 2020, and they wanted to look at dosing after the onset. So this is more like a late onset, onset Alzheimer's disease model, which is what the field needs to be moving towards to uh, really get more clinical applications. So they came up with a study design using chimeric aducanumab in which they would have a 28-day pilot pharmacokinetic study and a longer-term chronic uh, pharmacodynamic study, 12 plus weeks. So the, the great thing about this is that they have a large number of animals or more animals than are typically used. Uh, these animals are both genotype and sex balanced. And they're looking at all of these different uh, biomarkers uh, they're looking at A-beta plaque formation, they're doing behavioral model modeling all at, at the University of Pittsburgh, then they're working on PKPD modeling and uh, imaging here at IU School of Medicine. With small molecules, they had traditionally used small molecule mass spectrometry to model the PK and PD of the different uh, uh, quantitation of the small molecules within the plasma and within the brain of the animals. So they went about developing an ELISA for chimeric aducanumab, uh, as that is kind of typical in the field, instead of uh, mass spectrometry. However, in working on this ELISA, what they found is that with this biotherapeutic, there's a very limited dynamic range. Uh, so only two and a half orders of magnitude in which you can quantify the chimeric aducanumab via an ELISA method. There's also very significant interference with endogenous amyloid, and so, they were seeing a very large amount of genotype variability. So essentially, some of the animals that had Alzheimer's and they were being treated late in the disease had significant amounts of aggregated A-beta, which are interfering directly with the aducanumab ELISA assay. At this point, they turned to us and they wanted to know if they could develop a more fit-for-purpose method using targeted mass spectrometry to measure the concentration of aducanumab. So they came to us with the requests of selectively and sensitively measuring chimeric aducanumab in both mouse cortex samples and mouse plasma samples, um, specifically with the caveat that 5X FAD mice have high levels of these A-beta plaques interfering with ELISAs and potentially causing background in any mass spec assay. Uh, they also found that there were phenotypic changes occurring in some of the IgG control dosed mice um, and we wanted to really confirm that there were no dosing swaps uh, or if there had been dosing swaps to quantify aducanumab in any of the potential control mice. This is an overview of all of the assay development that has to happen if you are going to do a targeted mass spec uh, um, assay in a really a high, high tier um, manner. And so there can be a lot of different rounds of optimization that have to occur. First, you need to look at the protein of interest and select proteotypic triptych peptides. Then you can purchase synthetic peptide standards. These are typically heavy isotope labeled peptides. Um, they are slightly expensive, but uh, five mil milligram aliquot of uh, heavy labeled peptides can last for thousands of samples. Um, you then optimize your LCMS parameters. So you're going to look at your precursor ions and which specific fragment ions allow you to get good signal to noise uh, and get a good response curve, which is your limit of detection and lower limit of quantification. So you'll look at these curves in the presence and absence of your different matrices. You also want to look at the stability of your peptides. You want to understand uh, if, when you're doing the full process of digestion of proteins and matrix, how long can you store these samples in the fridge or in our case on the Evo tips. Here, we also added a protein A enrichment step. So you might need to enrich from your sample. In the case of, in our case, uh, we needed to enrich from the cortex samples specifically to have enough chimeric aducanumab to quantify on the mass spec. Um, and then once you have your assay really well defined and well characterized, you can test your thousands of biological samples. So I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, slightly quickly, but I'm always happy to discuss offline, and my, I have given a longer form of this talk at the Skyline user meeting, and that's available online. So initially, you need to find these proteotryptic peptides, and so what, what I mean by a proteotryptic peptide is that it has to be a unique 
triptych peptide uh, that corresponds to just your protein of interest. And so we performed a DDA, which is data dependent analysis experiment of chimeric aducanumab spiked into mouse plasma uh, with a typical proteome discoverer search. And so this is showing coverage of these, the heavy and light chain of chimeric aducanumab. Again, this is a humanized uh, um, antibody. So it has the humanized variable region with a mouse IgG 2A constant. So one of the challenges with uh, antibody quantification using PRM methods is that there is long stretches of homologous sequences that are identical across many antibodies. So we wanted to really use an extensive literature search to choose truly unique peptides that we could uh, identify within mouse, my, mice uh, uh, tissues. So then you also want to hedge your bets. So we actually chose four different peptides to include in our uh, preliminary studies and testings. So then we took these four peptides, we ordered synthetic peptides, and we ordered heavily, heavy labeled synthetic peptides, and we did initial analysis in the mass spec, looking at the linear range of ionization. And we found that one of the peptides did not have good linear range. However, the other three highlighted here did have linear responses in the mass spec. Um, and we were able to get, get to get down to atomal level sensitivity uh, injected on the mass spec. And that is not an uncommon level of sensitivity looking at uh, these targeted PRM methods. So then we optimized our basic mass spec settings, including precursor charge state, fragmentation energy, and overall resolution settings before moving into looking at these peptides in different matrices. So we needed to really think about how we were extracting our proteins. We wanted it to be consistent across cortex and plasma so we could multi, uh, so we could run hundreds of samples. Uh, initially, we used our eight molar urea protocol, which is really great at extracting all proteins from many different samples. We also needed to be aware that we were looking at uh, two peptides that were actually modified. So we have one peptide that has a cysteine on it in which we needed to optimize the alkylation step to ensure that we were really consistently seeing exactly the same peptide every time we were looking for it. We also had one peptide with a methionine that is typically oxidized at some percentage. And so we monitor both the oxidized and unoxidized forms of this DIQ peptide. Um, and we find that in our experiments, we have mostly unoxidized DIQ, but in the biological system, we have a mix of about 50-50. We then needed to consider our throughput. So we had over a thousand samples to eventually process. And so we moved from our normal LC, which is an easy nano, to the EVOCEP 100, which uh, Dr. Mosley already gave a great introduction about. So we can run hundreds of samples per day, very reproducibly using this EVOCEP. Um, we also optimized the loading and spike in of the stable isotope label uh, peptides on EVOTIPS. So with that, we developed curves, uh, generated limits of detection and lower limits of quantification of chimeric aducanumab. So this is an example of some of the data that I would look at when I'm optimizing. And so on the left here, uh, these are two different peptides. All of the different colors are the quantification of the precursor ions. So we're selecting, or the, we're selecting a precursor, and these are quantification of the fragment ions under that precursor peak. And so this allows us to make sure we're uh, selecting the exact same peptide every time because we should see the same ratio of fragment ions um, no matter what the concentration. So these are the two, two different, uh, this is the same peptide in cortex and in plasma, and we detail developed a limit of detection and lower limit of quantification. We then wanted to see if that was real. We didn't have a model for how much uh, chimeric aducanumab was actually getting into mouse cortex. So we started with the mouse cortex and we ran four of the cortex samples through this entire process, um, loading about two micrograms of total protein on our Evo tips. However, when we ran the samples, only one of those four, the high dosage uh, level had quantifiable aducanumab. So with this, we went back to uh, the Model AD Consortium and we said, this typical PRM method works. It gives us linear response. However, the level of protein within mouse cortex is so low that we need to add an enrichment step. So we went back to our assay map Bravo. We had support from Model AD to continue with better uh, additional experiments and we, added a protein A enrichment step. So protein A is going to bind this chimeric aducanumab 
and we're going to enrich it prior to the digestion and then loading on the Evo tips. So we had to change our extraction buffer because we could no longer use a completely denaturing buffer with the protein A. Uh, we tested both RIPA and a HEAPS NP40 lysis buffer. We tested several different wash and elution buffers based on literature. And then we automated all steps um, other than smashing the individual mouse cortexes and individually extracting protein. But luckily, each mouse only had one cortex sample. So um, this is our overview then. So more than a few moments later, uh, there is extensive development, but we have a really solid assay. We had over 166 mice. This is actually lower because we ended up getting some more mice from a different cohort here at IU School of Medicine. Um, the cortex samples had to be cryoprepped and then homogenized to extract all of the protein from the cortex, whereas plasma, luckily, we can just uh, simply dilute in a RIPA buffer. But then all, all of these samples go through the same enrichment step uh, on the assay map Bravo, a trypsin digestion, also using the assay map Bravo, and an Evo tip load step. We move the Evo tips over to the Evo step one, where we are running 100 samples per day on our Orbitrap Fusion Lumos. And then all data analysis is using the Skyline uh, targeted quantitation uh, suite of software, which is freely available. Anyone can download it. Uh, th this user group is who I gave a talk for this uh, summer at the American Society of Mass Spectrometry user meeting. Uh, with our final assay workflow, we are capable of running about 350 to 400 samples per week. Uh, so once we finally got it rolling, uh, we were able to finish analyzing almost 1500 samples and all everything is done processing. Um, so an example of again of what some of this data look like is this is monitoring four different pep peptides across the 31 pilot cortex samples. So again, this is antibody that's getting into mouse cortex, which is a fascinating process in and of itself. But here you can see that all four of these peptides track very quantitatively. So even though we're gonna just use one peptide uh, for our final uh, quant value, uh, the, the other three really let us monitor if there are any issues with the sample prep. In the pilot samples, then we were able to confidently quantify chimeric aducanumab uh, from animals that were both both dosed with one mg per kg weekly or 30 mg per kg weekly or in a single dose. Uh, and we were able to confirm that none of the IgG controls were uh, given aducanumab, in fact. We uh, quantified from 0.4 to 30 nanograms per milligram as the range that we saw uh, in vivo in these samples across the four co cohorts of animals. In the plasma, we have a similar linear range, and I just wanted to show you this really beautiful data from the four-week pilot PK. So this is pharmacokinetic data, and we had nine different time points across the about 37 different animals. Um, again, none of the IgG controls showed any quantifiable aducanumab, whereas here we can see really beautifully that in the single 30 mg per kg dose, we have a linear decrease in chimeric aducanumab in the plasma. Um, we're modeling male and female, and there are a couple of different differences, but over, overall, the half-life is about nine days, which is exactly what was anticipated from the human model of chimeric aducanumab. Uh, here we can also see the weekly dose of 30 mg per kg. And what I really like about this uh, graph is that you can see this animal right here, this female at the bottom where it goes all the way down, um, this is a misdosed uh, animal. So this animal was receiving a weekly one and a half milligram per kilogram. And we were able to identify that using mass spectrometry. Um, so everything else in the behavioral aspects has been completely blinded, and they're going to be able to unblind the behavior and A beta plaque uh, based on our absolute quantification values. And here, the weekly one and a half mg per kg value, again, hovering right around uh, two to 10 micrograms per mil of chimeric aducanumab in the plasma. So our next steps are, we have run all the samples, we're finalizing the data, and we're gonna work with the clinical pharmacology analytical core here at IU School of Medicine to do some of the modeling, uh, as that's a really important part of the Model AD uh, ethos. We're going to integrate the data and unblind data about the A beta plaque 
uh, formation, quantitation, uh, behavior data, all of that is from UPIT, and the imaging data and target engagement that's been done here at IU School of Medicine. Then, of course, all of this data will be publicly available. So bioarchive papers should be coming out very soon. Uh, all of the mass spec data will be available on Panorama, and these are the uh, Skyline Panorama teams have been really helpful. Uh, and they're really friendly. And obviously a huge team of people worked on this, including all of the members of the IU uh, Center for Proteome Analysis, the IU Model AD team, um, and the, the rest of the PTC core at University of Pittsburgh, SAGE, and Jackson Laboratories. And here's a good place to pause if there are any questions about PRM assays. So uh, maybe, could you maybe comment on development of new ones? Yes, and if you want to develop a new assay, uh, you can reach out and we can have a consult. There are also a number of assays available that have been uh, developed. One really great resource is the CPTAC assay portal. That's the um, clinical proteomics tumor analysis, analysis consortium. consortium. Yeah, CPTAC. From, the, from the NCI. Yeah, from NCI. And they have an assay portal. And so a lot of different biomarkers that are relevant to cancer specifically, but often other disease states. Um, people have developed and uh, have peptides listed. Otherwise, we can either do a preliminary study uh, looking at your protein just to see uh, what sort of peptides we are able to detect, um, or if anyone else has done any work on it. Uh, and so we have a couple of other projects in development. Uh, again, it is a significant amount of time and effort to develop these assays, so we really recommend if it's going to be hundred, at least hundreds of samples that you want to run. Um, but we're always happy to support or give a consult for various experiments. Okay, so thank you, Emma. And then I will mention also that, um, and, and Emma touched on this a little bit, that the um, sample prep is very different depending on if we're using plasma mm -hmm. serum, plasma and serum are somewhat similar, uh, but then versus tissue. And so then that's another caveat that if um, you want to develop these methods, and we can also do it in cell lines um, or in any other type of um, um, biofluid, right, that type of stuff as well, uh, but each one has its own caveats. Now, luckily, our core has worked with a very large number of different uh, tissue and sample types, and so we do have a lot of experience in the sample prep side on that end as well, and so we, um, we don't just offer the analytical side, we also offer that support in the sample prep, so it's just good to know. So then um, now I'm going to talk about our, um, I guess, our newest uh, method that we're um, now offering, which is the Olink Explore platform, um, which is another type of targeted mass spectrometry. It's, it's actually a targeted, um, it's a targeted method. It's not mass spectrometry based. So I'll talk about that. And so basically, um, this is a proprietary, um, this is a proprietary technology, um, which makes use of proximity extension assays or PEAs. Um, and it doesn't use mass spectrometry. In this case, it uses high throughput sequencing. And so all of the methods using Olink um, are a collaboration between um, us and then also the Center for Medical Genomics. And so um, I'll mention, we can talk about more about that as well. The way that these assays work is that you have a target protein of interest, and then there is an amino assay. We do this part in the proteomics core. And so similar to what I was just saying earlier, um, we can do this. It's very well optimized for plasma and serum um, for humans specifically. So this panel is for human samples, uh, clinical samples, but you can also use cell lines, um, anything as long as it's uh, human derived. And so, uh, but these amino assays have antibodies, uh, antibody pairs, which have been developed to specifically um, identify those human proteins um, in a pairwise basis. And each one of the individual antibodies is tagged uh, with a single-stranded DNA molecule, which is complementary um, to only the other single-stranded uh, single DNA molecule that's on the paired antibody, right? And so when these come in close proximity, you can get hybridization of those two to form a double-stranded DNA, uh, which can then be uh, amplified by PCR. And so these first two steps, immunoreaction and PCR, are all done within the proteomics core. Um, we use these instruments um, down here for high throughput, um, the dragonfly and the mosquito. Each one of these kits to be able to perform this analysis comes with all of the antibodies already arrayed on a plate. And we can do this in a high throughput fashion. So we actually process, 
we can process um, quite a number of samples within a week. We can do a full 88 samples across 3,000 targets, right? And so, um, and then send that to sequencing. And depending on the sequencing backlog, uh, we usually can get data back in around two weeks. And so within this um, um, particular assay, um, we've also already developed the methods for extraction from um, cell lines. We did that within actually my research laboratory. So we work a lot with the proteomics core on developmental stuff. Uh, we received some funding actually from the Dean's office, um, the Department of Biochemistry, and also the CTSI um, to be able to optimize those methods. So we have that available as well. We have the buffers optimized to be able to do extraction from cell lines um, and likely tissue as well, although we have not piloted that yet. So uh, once we finish the PCR amplification, uh, we hand this off for another round of PCR to the Center for Medical Genomics, and then we go through and do this with high throughput sequencing analysis. And so we give you the data um, all back together, which you get a normalized um, abundance value, which is called an MPX value, uh, which they generate with Olink Explorer um, software. And I'll show you what some of that data looks like, if I can remember how to use my computer. So then <laughs> the reason that this is important um, it, is that when you think about this relative to RNA sequencing, um, RNA sequencing um, is, is not a substitute for protein level measurement. So one of the major challenges when you do RNA sequencing is that you cannot assume that anything that you're seeing changing in abundance is going to correlate one to one to protein level. It's been shown repeatedly in the literature that this is not the case. And so there's a discordance between the protein level and the RNA level. And in addition, since this method has been optimized for plasma and serum analysis, most of the proteins that are in plasma and serum don't come from plasma and serum. They're secreted into the bloodstream um, from cells throughout the body, right? And so there would be no way to quantify what's present in those um, biofluids anyway using RNA-seq. And so that is why it's really optimal for O-link analysis. Uh, we can also use this for secretome analysis from cell lines that are human of human origin. And so that's something that we can do as well. And then one of the nice things about this is it's a low input required, so we need a very small amount of starting material. We really recommend if you have serum or plasma, we only need 20 microliters to be able to do these experiments. And we will only use about a microliter of that, but we need the 20 microliters to cover the bottom of the plate. And so once we use the one microliter, the robots pick it up, we can give you the other 19 back. And we've done that recently in a project um, for someone here at the School of Medicine. Um, in addition, this, um, these experiments can be compared to other large-scale data sets um, that are being analyzed, like the UK Biobank study, where they've expanded to this Olink Explorer platform, uh, because all of the analytes are identical because it's antibody-based. And so you can do direct comparisons as long as you're using the same types of starting material. So um, in this particular analysis, we did a full Olink 3072 panel. Um, which um, is made up of these smaller pa panels, so it's kind of a modular setup. And what's nice about that is that we can also offer this modular 384 analysis, um, like if you want to focus on inflammation markers. And so that's something that we can do as well, but in this particular one, we did the full O-Link uh, 3072 analysis. And so um, we get different data that comes back that looks something like this, so we can do quality control analysis. We can see how many of the assays actually pass quality control. Um, you can see that we have very high um, passing. This one, we had some problems with the instrument. We've since had all of this repaired. So that's with that high throughput, um, um, small volume pipetting um, instrument. So then now that this has been repaired, we're really passing quality control on 100%. So this has been optimized. And then we can see across different um, plates that we have some markers, um, including some of the cytokines um, that are present on multiple plates across the entire Olink, uh, Olink panels. And so because of that, we can get correlation matrices across the samples, and we can see that the correlation um, is very good. So you would expect a one-to-one -one correlation to be kind of a straight line. And you can see for the majority of these targets that you see a, a fairly straight line across these analyses. So then uh, once we have this data, uh, we can do a lot of the, the general analyses that you would do with other omics platforms, uh, like principal component analysis. 
So in this particular sample group, which was um, given us to, to us by Dan Runco, um, so, so Dan's group um, had identified these as three different groups, um, which I won't go into the biology of the samples, uh, but basically you can see that we have separation of some of the groups, this L group in particular, um, that is separating from the other groups, so you can see that pretty well. Um, and those are things that we can track using this analysis. And since it's at a large scale, this was 78 individual samples. Uh, we have a high statistical power. So this gives you a lot more statistical power than what you get when you typically use um, some of the other assay types. And so uh, we can do volcano plots. Um, we can do fold changes. So we have um, that as well. So you can see for different markers. Um, you'll see that a lot of these are inflama uh, inflammatory markers. Um, we, can, we can identify statistical differences. We can give all of this information back um, where you can get individual um, proteins of interest. You can get their quantitation along with a quantitation of uh, just under 3,000 um, targets. And so these are our rates um, that have been approved by IU Bloomington for um, 2025. And what I would like you to note is that we have an internal cost um, we, have a, we have a discounted rate or a subsidized rate for IU Summon Cancer Center members per sample. Um, this first row at the top is if you're going to run a 384 panel. So that's two out of the eight panels. So you're not going to get all 3,000 proteins. You're going um, um, to get less than that. Uh, but if you run all eight panels, um, these are the costs per sample um, for this analysis. Uh, we also have the cost for um, external academic users. If you are within the CTSI, you will get the internal costs, not necessarily the IU Simon Cancer Center rate, but you'll get internal costs. Um, and then we also have an external industry cost that's been approved as well. So I'll just sit on that for just a minute. And then I just would like to thank um, a number of people that helped with this. So then within my lab, uh, we had a postdoc uh, that had helped us with this project, Michaela Stevens. Um, who was who was did a great job at getting some of that analysis of the the uh, cell line um, lysate conditions um, off the ground, and then the collaborators that I mentioned, Dan Runco and also Teresa Zemmers, have been working with us on that project where I showed the data, um, and some others as well with data that I have not shown. Um, a number of people, actually everybody from the Center for Medical Genomics has been really helpful. Um, and so I've highlighted some of the individuals who contributed to the data that I showed here. And then also the, um, and everybody within the Center for Proteome Analysis, and then these individuals who contributed to the samples that I'd shown. So um, that's all that I had. And so I wanted to not take the full hour in case anybody had questions. Um, if not, if everybody needs to go, then you can get your time back. Uh, but Emma and I are both here, and we would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your time.